uh, it's really an honor for us to have such an experienced cardiologist who basically hails from Italy. He wo- she was raised in Milan. She has done a lot of exclusive research at University of Penn and graduated in electrophysiology. She has my big respect because I also belong to that field, in fact. And uh, she has a, also a master in sports cardiology. And currently she's working at Milan and uh, hailing from Italy and working in Italy, she has been getting quite a lot uh, exposed and also a lot of experience of how to handle these uh, corona patients as well. So there has been a lot of questions from our healthcare professionals and colleagues as well, how to deal with those different situations. And that's what we will try to uh, speak to her and try to gain more experience and uh, the knowledge uh, from Dr. Magnani, like how can it be more helpful not just for the healthcare professionals, but also for the general population as well. So over to Dr. Magnani. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here and talking to you. I think sharing our experience is our greatest power, especially in this time when there is some a lot that we know and a lot that we do not know. So sharing our experience is our greatest power at the moment. Thank you so much. So can you please tell us how has been your experience? So when we talk in terms of the general population and uh, also about those frontline healthcare professionals, because I am aware, like not just in Italy, but even in UK as well, uh, the number of healthcare professionals as well, who has been dying due to the infection of corona patients has been on the increase in fact. And there are a lot of new countries as well where the disease has been affecting it has been also affecting the healthcare professionals other than the patients as well. So kindly share your experience and tips and tricks as well, please. Thank you. So in Italy, about 15% of healthcare workers are have been infected with the COVID-19 virus. So this is something new for us. This is something that we never experienced before. So a complete reorganization and reassessment of the medical staff is needed. Uh, there was a huge issue of resources allocation, um, the lack of protective gear, the lack of uh, PPI. And so now it's very important for us to be aware of what is the problem. So we don't have to wait between neglect and panic. And now we're in the, approaching the phase two, so we don't want to sleep again in the neglect. So we have to be prepared and to be aware of the problem. It's very important to create a workflow for patient identification so we know what we are facing. So are we dealing with a clean patient? Are we dealing with a sick patient with COVID-19 infection? Or we don't know, because there are that patients that are kind of in the limb we are running tests on them, and, and so we're waiting to get the result of the test. So we have different approach to this patient, but we have to remember that every patient, even with a negative test, can be a positive patient. So there is a huge issue with the negative, the false negative. Wow. So our approach, has to be with every patient, like the patient can have a COVID-19 infection. So we have to protect ourselves. How we can, how we can identify the patient? Of course, a CT scan with a grand glass opacities is very suggestive. Uh, another important thing we can do with our patient is to test them. So the swab has to be done in a proper way so it's not just in the peripheral area of the nose, but we have to go all the way back and it's actually painful for the patient and patient uh, can complain about that, mm-hmm. but we have to perform the test in the proper way. Uh, speaking about blood tests, we don't have yet uh, a very reliable result. Wow. We're start having new information about it, about the EGM, EGG detection that we can have. Uh, but at the moment, there are not certain uh, evidence that 
those tests are reliable. Mm -hmm. Something that we can introduce in our practice, our daily practice can be uh, implemented with uh, ultrasound, pulmonary ultrasound. So pulmonary ultrasound are not very specific, but are sensitive. So that is very important. Try to find to identify patient with COVID-19 infection and lung disease. We know that this disease may have, uh, can be, can have different uh, phenotypes. So patient may be completely asymptomatic or be, or having a very dramatic impact of the disease. So with ultra, pulmonary ultrasound, we are able to identify some sign that are suggestive of the disease. For example, we can find thickening of the pleural line, we can find B line, right. we can find subpleural consolidation, we can find a bronchogram into the consolidation or localized pleural effusion around the consolidation. All those findings are suggestive of the disease. Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, uh, thank you again for sharing all those insights. So you really well pointed it out really well about those investigations, which a patient has to, or even a suspected case has to go through literally right from the swab test about the blood tests as well. And now even the newer stages uh, as which uh, we are entering is about the vaccine production as well. So I am aware like in US, even in uh, some of our colleagues in Oxford as well. So they have already started testing for the vaccines as well. So what kind of protocol do you follow if uh, there is a, uh, someone comes uh, to your hospital or, or at your center uh, with a history of cough, with fever, and maybe even possible a loose motion. So what, how do you follow uh, them up? Like, what are the protocols do you follow? Do you so, still wait first for- of all, do you still wait family for family and friend cannot stay with the patient. So, Family and friend cannot stay there with the patient. Uh, all the family member will be in touch with the hospital staff by phone. So we will connect with family and friends. We will call them and we will give them information. But the patient has to be isolated as much as we can. Then every patient can nasal swap, every patient, no exception. And if the history is very suggestive, uh, we will perform a CT scan. Uh, and pulmonary ultrasound is included in our uh, everyday uh, routine assessment of every patient now, okay. like as a first line. Okay, so after doing those tests, so uh, how do you differentiate, for example, some patients which will be going to the wards, some patients will be going to the critical care unit or something like that? So, we have a color-coded fashion to address COVID-19 patient. So uh, based on the intensity of care. So the green, green patient are the kind of COVID-19 patient that need hospitalization, but not very high intensity of care. Of course, the red area is with patient that need to be intubated and the yellow area is something in the middle. For patients that need uh, airway support with mask, uh, with helmet, and with non-invasive ventilation, but they are not at the point to require intubation. Okay, this is again really good to know. And how has been your experience? Because I can also correlate to a little bit of that is like being trained in cardiology for such a long, long time. And then we are being deputed in other uh, wards and other areas. At least I have with, uh, I'm sure I think you will also agree that we all have been away from those fields as well uh, from practicing. So how has been your experience? How has been, uh, how did they try to implement it at your center in Italy as well? Well, you know, as you know, uh, we face another flow of patients. So we have to find medical staff and nurses and technician and hospital bed. So most of the elective procedure has been canceled, completely canceled. So what can be postponed is gonna be postponed. So everyone 
is into it. So everyone needs to help. So as a physician, as a cardiologist, we are still performing some uh, procedure wearing full protective gear. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, we also had to relocate in COVID-19 floors and help with that. So we have to go back and try to learn for, from intensive care physician. So they have been very nice and very helpful trying to help us. And, but it was required support from everyone. So every nurse, every cardiologist, every physician has to be involved in that. And, and how does it, a typical day, for example, for you look like when you go to the, in the new role at your hospital? A typical, Can you a typical day schedule, how does it look like, for example, to work? Because we know as a cardiologist or as an electrophysiologist, there are different specialized procedures which normally everyone tends to do. How has been a, a day, how does a typical day look for you, for example, when you go in the morning? So, for example, do you have morning rounds in the new role, I mean to say? Those COVID patients, do you do rounds, those meetings? and? Uh, yes, yes. Okay. Yes, so once again, some of us are branding on the cardiology floor. Some of us are branding in COVID unit. So in COVID unit, uh, we have a morning round and then uh, a group of physicians and nurses check patient by patient, writing notes and checking saturation, checking the breathing, physical exam and good cleaning again prepare again. So the problem is the spreading among patients. So it's important to wash yourself and change your gear from patient to patient. And it's important to know how to wear all the gear yes. for facing COVID-19. That is very, very important. And even more important is to be careful to undress. So once again, you can actually do a ex mental exercise to try to repeat the step of this process. So gloves, gloves, gown, then you wear mask, glo glasses, hat. And so then you have to wear the second pair of gloves and you have to cover your shoes. So that is the dress. And then you have to go faster and faster and repeat it, repeat it, repeating to be careful because especially in the phase of getting undressed is the critical phase where you can get contaminated. And since we have a high number of uh, physician and nursing that got contaminated, we don't know if they get it into the hospital for lack of protective gear, especially in the first phase, or they got contaminated or they get infected uh, outside the hospital. We don't know that yet. Um, it's very important to be careful on the undress phase. So why you're, you don't have to touch anything that has been exposed. So you can only touch the inside of the globe. You can only touch the inside of your gown. So it's important to protect your eyes as well. So this, this is a droplet disease and your eyes, are the way that the virus can get inside your body. So that is very, very important to protect your hands. Yeah. So this is again a very important and very uh, good tip uh, for our colleagues as well. Uh, I'm aware there are several recent studies and meta-analysis which is trying to investigate what are the possible reasons for the rising number of deaths in the physicians and also the healthcare professionals as well. So some of the conditions they have been trying to tell about those uh, racial predisposition, but some of those uh, things are also pointing out to things uh, like doffing. So donning of the PPEs and doffing. So how to take it off. And as Dr. Magdani already pointed out very well, so it is equally and even more important to know the steps of doffing. And uh, you already really explained it very well where to put up the hands or how while taking out the gloves and especially while trying to take out those uh, face equipments or the face masks and all those things as well. So thank you again for sharing all those uh, insights. So 
what what are your comments uh, for example for the general population general population again we can think of like so someone who is really healthy uh, but yes uh, hearing about the pandemic status of this disease as well a lot of people are getting afraid and there is also of course there are some chronic ill disease patients as well so someone is a hypertensive diabetic they are taking those medications and all so what are your tips uh, for our common uh, you know, people as well the non medical professionals so first of all it's very important for general population to identify proper source of information. There are a lot of websites and there are a lot of fake news and misleading theory about the virus. So it's important to find uh, reliable sources of information to read about it, to understand that, to learn about it. Uh, it's very important for a healthy person to keep it clean. So uh, try to eat a lot of vegetables, try to eat a lot of fruit, uh, take your vitamins also, since the vitamin C, vitamin D are very important to protect and strengthen your body. Um, there is the importance of the sunlight. If you're locked down, you will have a lack of sunlight and vitamin D deposition on your bone. So try to get as much sunlight as you can, even if you're staying inside. So, so try to face the window. Uh, yeah. If you have a balcony or a terrace, try to spend at least 20, 30 minutes per day in the sunlight. Of course, protect your, your skin again. Uh, so use a sunlight screen, but try to be exposed with the sunlight. Uh, it's very important to avoid binge drinking. Uh, in terms of eating, you can indulge a little bit, so it's treat yourself, yeah. but avoid to eat, overeat, so avoid binge eating. And it's very important for you to keep exercise. So if you just stay at home all day, you actually are at high risk of pulmonary embolism, like you're on a flight for eight hours if you sit for eight hours. So even if you are taking an international flight, flight attendant recommend you to move your legs. So I find very, very helpful a lot of apps for yoga or like static exercise um, that you can do at home. In many countries, not in Italy, uh, it's a lot to walk outside. Uh, there is the problem of social distance. If you're all outside, somebody or walking around about crowded place, again, and remember that if the distance between person has to be about nine feet, so about one meter, one meter, and all two meter, mm -hmm. uh, if you're running, you are breathing very fast. And so the recommended distancing between runners is actually 20 meters. Right. That's, That's again, something another very that I, I haven't seen around. So I yes. see that runners go and they stay kind of close together. Mm -hmm. So they are supposed to stay 20 meters away because we're excelling, excelling. Yes. And we're, if we're positive and we don't know that, we are spreading the virus. And there is also the very important thing of wearing masks. And everybody know that at the time. So if you're not a medical professional, try to avoid to use um, FFP2 or FFP3 mask that are protecting yourself. Uh, but you can wear a surgical mask to protect others. Uh, it's very important to clean open your hands or wash your hands. So that scramble of the hand is not enough. So it has to be an intense way to wash your hand. So you have to be careful to wash your line long enough so for two three minutes so it's important to wash the palm of the hand to wash between the finger the back of the hands and the tip of the finger and the nail so once again wash your hand the back between the finger between the finger and the tip of your nail 
that's again a very important thing uh, because a lot of times we tend to think as well even in uk i can never forget Boris Johnson was literally trying to preach about the benefits of uh, washing hands and all those 30 second song and all was there so it's really important for everyone as well while taking washing hands uh, the various steps which was shared to us by dr magnani as well it should be followed for doing it effectively just doing is not enough doing it right is what really makes the right difference and uh, it was very important as well uh, about the role of vitamin d as well so there are some literature which is again seems to be favoring the role of vitamin d as well even uh, a possible possibility uh, just a distance uh, like if someone is locked up and all in a house for a long really long time so depression and all those things may happen so you were really uh, really right in pointing out the role of exercise and being uh, not just menti mentally active but also a uh, role of being physically active as well in these things so this is uh, something really important and again uh, you emphasized it very well about the role of masks as well so for example what type of masks should be used by what type of people as well so that's again uh, something very important and uh, i think maybe you may also agree that there's a newer trend of uh, using those uh, mobile covers as well have you been at your center are they using it as well mobile covers um, so in my in my center for my phone, I use like uh, all the bags that I use to put everything in the fridge. So yes. it's not really like a very structural thing. I've actually used just those pockets. And the very important thing again is to change them. The same problem of wearing gloves. So if I wear gloves and I keep the same glove all day, it's actually much worse than washing my hand often. So if you're using cover for your phone the very important thing is to change them often yes so this was again another very valid point uh, as you rightly pointed it out yes covers people should use but they should also keep on changing them as well otherwise nowadays uh, they say mobile phones are the ones which has the maximum harboring of germs as well so not just for common germs but even for the covid patient uh, germs as well it can be uh, happening very uh, well in fact so and not another tip is jewelry so if you're wearing a ring if you're wearing bangs tr just try to avoid them so when you wash your hands just don't stop here go all the way back mm -hmm. and so if you're wearing jewelry that's carrying the germ another thing that i may suggest for musk that we may not think about it is to shave yourself and for females just keep your hair higher up so mm -hmm. don't spread your hair all over mm -hmm. that is very important so just try to keep your hair higher up and contain the hair and and the mask have to adhere to your face Absolutely. so when you wear a mask just press with your finger over your face on the nose especially and if you wear glasses uh, you have to wear clear and if that is not very fixed on your nose you will not wear because your your glasses are gonna get uh all the sweat is gonna get the breathing is gonna cover your glasses so once again just again, to wear the mask yeah. in the proper way and which mask so if you're walking on the street to protect water from uh from your droplet for your from your breathing uh, you can wear a surgical mask or you can wear a bandana or just something to cover your mm, mouth and nose uh, the problem with the mask with valves is that actually are spreading even more <laughs> the virus because it's is actually uh, vaporizing so it's spreading even more the valve is spreading even more so if you get close to me using the valve is actually enhancing the power of dispersion of the virus so i strongly recommend against using mask with valves so do not use valve again uh, this is a very valid point and a very important uh, tip for us everyone not just uh, the healthcare profession but also the general people to think and understand it as well because they tend to think that oh more fancy a device looks like so it might be also much more effective 
and doing or giving them protection as well. But as I said, it right thing should be done in the right way as well. It's not just about, uh, for example, uh, you rightly pointed it out about the care of the hair, but even for the men as well about uh, being clean shaven. Um, even at my center, we did have some of our colleagues who were feeling a little bit offended uh, that you know they have to completely clean shave it all. Yeah. Uh, uh, because one of the other important things for this week, uh, which you again already pointed it out, is something is called about the there should be no air gap, especially the uh, mask which is being used or which is being uh, put up as well. So that is why uh, in UK at least a lot of centers they do definitely what is called as a fit testing. So they will put up a mask. They will try to see if, uh, without any air seal, if one is still able to inhale or uh, uh, smell it out as well to, to rule out any possible air leaks. So this concept is very important. To there sh must be like no air leakages. Otherwise, through those air leakages, because these viruses are very very small. In fact, and they can always spread through those droplets. So this is again another important concept which you shared in fact. So thank you again for sharing for this. Now coming to the treatment part, how has been your experience? Because even about treatment as well, there's a lot of confusion which is going on uh, because uh, none of the big uh, endorsed, uh, none of the big bodies, I would say like the US FDA or the European Medical Agency as well, none of them has been able to endorse any of those drugs there are different centers which are using a lot of other drugs as well. There's a lot of confusion. I'm aware some of the physicians, they also try to use some medications prophylactically and a uh, few doctors have even died as well for that. So any comments about the treatment strategy? So once again, since nowadays there is not uh, a real treatment that has been proved, uh, we are enrolling patients in a lot of trial, clinical trial. We are trying to do our best for our patient and taking very good care of them. But at the moment, there are not medical evidence of what is really working, what is curing the patient. So our greatest access is prevention. So we are speaking about a lot about uh, hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin, especially in the early phase of the disease. Uh, it seems that if we give, gave this medication uh, in a very advanced phase of the disease, it's not really effective. It seems to be more promising in the early phase. However, it's possible that also those medications have some side effects. So first of all, do not harm. Do not harm your patient. Uh, the important thing is try to monitor the heartbeat. So if you are at home, if you're taking this medication, uh, and if you have loss of consciousness, uh, call for medical attention. So that can be very, very scary for you. And it can be a life-threatening arrhythmia. So call your doctor immediately if you lost consciousness. Uh, it's very important to stay properly hydrated and uh, integrate electrolytes. So if you're sweating a lot because of fever, if you have vom if you're vomiting or if you have diarrhea, it's very important to integrate the salt up for your body. So with specific magnesium and potassium especially because those medications can affect uh, cardiac repolarization and also electrolyte can affect cardiac repolarization. And that can be uh, a big concern for life threatening arrhythmia. Mm -hmm. So, nowadays, there are some ways we are trying to organize in our region a way to monitor heartbeat for patients at home and not, in, not only in hospital. But that is something in progress. We have no data yet that can prove that a uh, heartbeat device can actually have a proper assessment of QT. Mm -hmm. uh, no, that's again a very important and valid point as well, which you already emphasized about it. And there are some uh, antiretroviral therapy as well, which is being used. And most of the things we, which we all should keep it in mind is 
none of the therapies is yet proven. Like even agencies like USFP and EME and all, they all have not approved any kind of therapy. Most of them are in uh, the different phases of trial, which is already going on. Data collection is going on. There are some early trends. What does happen a lot of times is that, okay, there may be some positive trends for a therapy, but later on it may turn out to be otherwise as well. So let's try to have some patience and let's try to move it in a scientific way as well. Uh, let's not uh, try to treat human beings as guinea pigs as well, that trying to take this, take that without any having scientific evidence as well. So that's also very important, which you already uh, shared it. Thank you so much again for sharing all those insights. And uh, now, we all, uh, wherever in the world we all are there, we all love Italy for sure for its different contribution. But we are aware that uh, Italy has been one of the worst uh, sufferers also uh, with this disease as well. So we are very curious to know that from someone like you who has been a frontline healthcare professional as a specialist who has been working day to day as well and seeing coming across those situations as well. How has been the situation going across? So for example, uh, especially over the months. So for example, when we uh, now we are almost towards the end of April. And for example, when we'll try to talk in terms of like January or February. So first of all, we're more aware of what could be the problem. So at the beginning, there was some sort of neglect. Then we kind of panicking. And then now we're moving toward like an acceptance or like a more rational way to see at that. So we are learning more, we are more organized, we are more protected, um, and the curve is flattened. So we're not anymore at the peak. So resources are greater. So uh, we do have hospital bed dedicated for them. Um, we have more uh, bedside either into the intensive care unit um, so that is getting better from a medical perspective for in hospital patient uh, I think it's getting worse for patient that, for person that are at home because it's psychologically exhausting to stay at home and especially there is a huge impact of the economy oh, and yeah. so I can understand how difficult it is to stay at home as well. So I think while it's getting better from the hospital side, it's actually getting worse for the for person that are staying at home. And so that is why we are moving toward the phase two. So phase two doesn't mean that it's over. Phase two, in the phase two, we still have the virus around and we can still get infected. So it's very important in the phase two to reinforce the idea of keeping uh, social distancing. So we're open and essential shop, essential uh, work activity, and we're moving toward our normal life that cannot be as normal as it used to be. That is phase two, it's not over. Again, so that is something that I wanna, it's a concept that I wanna stress a lot that is not over so i'm actually personally very scared about the idea of a second peak and so that is very important to stay protect and to start to move forward but be keeping in mind that we still have to wash our hands wear our mask and keep social distance as much as we can Again, uh, it was a very insightful uh, point which you already shared as well. We all are getting bothered about the economics part as well. So especially the government. So that's why they are trying to consider a early uh, release of the lockdown, no doubt about it. But the problem may happen, which uh, you pointed it out. And uh, it has already been seen in some of the parts of the world, like uh, like Japan, it seems. So early they really implemented, or even the Sweden as well. So initially, they, especially for Japan, they implemented the early lockdown, but later on, once they released that um, they were a little bit easy, like, okay, let the lockdown go. And then the number of cases started becoming worse. And so again, they are trying to reimpose the lockdown as well. So even same thing we are also hearing in US as well, 
like uh, especially in con uh, cities like New York, the condition has been really terrible. So uh, especially the, uh, thinking about the economical parts as well, UK is also again uh, trying to reconsider to uh, decrease the lockdown as well. But a uh, lot of healthcare professionals, of course, are still against it and they are not uh, favoring such kind of decisions. So it will be something really interesting to see how does it go and uh, WHO has already been warning against uh, such uh, easing of lockdown period as well. So it will be something again interesting. So some of the epidemiologists has already warned uh, that possibly with the onset of new winter, which is which will be uh, like maybe six or seven months later, on, maybe maybe if there might be something again a recurrence or something. So that will be again something interesting. But today we could learn a lot of important things as well from uh, Dr. Sylvia Magnani. And thank you so much for sharing all those insights and all. And really a pleasure and really uh, uh, we all enjoyed having the conversation and knowing all those preventive strategies, not just for the healthcare professionals, but also for the common population as well. Thank you so much again for sharing all those detailed insights. Thank you again. And I want just to say a final word. So for patients that stay at home, keep taking your medication. And if you have chest pain, go to the hospital. So we don't have to forget about every other uh, disease in the world. So don't be scared. If you have chest pain, go to the hospital. And thank you again for having me here. Thank you so much.